Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. I'm now into the middle of my second week teaching on John 14, 15, and 16. This is Jesus' last minute instructions that He gave to His disciples before His crucifixion. And you know, just by virtue of the fact that these are the last words He said to them before His crucifixion, it's bound to have been very important. He wasn't just saying anything, you know, to them. They were entering into this crisis situation and He was trying to prepare them for it. And so I've entitled this the Christian Survival Kit. This little USB thumb drive that we have literally has all of this teaching verse by verse through John 14, 15, and 16 on it. It's a long series. I'm giving an abbreviated form of it. But in a nutshell, this is Jesus telling His disciples the things that they needed to do to be able to prosper and maintain their joy and their faith over this critical period of time. And the same thing applies to us. And so the very first thing we talked about, John 14, 1, is let not your heart be troubled. Modern day interpretation, don't panic. Get your emotions under control. How do you do that? The latter part of verse 1 says, you believe in God, believe also in me. Faith is how you do that. The third thing he talked about was perspective. He talked to them about heaven, getting their eyes off of just things that can be seen and putting their attention on things that cannot be seen. Boy, this is so important when you're in a crisis situation that you don't let what is screaming at you in the natural dominate you, but you see behind the scenes. You see the spiritual realm. You recognize spiritual, eternal truth. You put everything into perspective. The fourth thing we talked about is you got to know God. Jesus talked about this, that they didn't know Him. He's, they said, we don't know where you're going. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. They knew Him, but they didn't know He was the answer. They didn't know He was the way, the truth, and the life. And the fact is that many Christians don't really know God, who He really is, and what is available to Him. So we got to know Him. The fifth thing we talked about is you know Him through the Word. And he talked about that. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When I'm speaking unto you, it's the Father speaking unto you. You know God through the revelation he's given in his word. If you try and invent your own God and just come up with your own way of thinking about him, then in a sense, you're creating an idol. It's not up to us to pick and choose and say, we want God to be this way. Who is God? He revealed Himself through the Bible and we know Him through the Word. And then what I started talking about yesterday was the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He said He would send us another comforter, one just like Him. And I was talking about how crucial it is to have the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I also use John chapter 14, verse 26, that the Holy Spirit, when He has come, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I've spoken unto you. You know, I believe that God sees the problems that are coming our way, and He tries to prepare us. I gave an example yesterday about how God spoke a prophecy to me two years before I needed it. And I actually had forgotten it, but when I was in a crisis situation, I began to start praying in tongues and asking God to interpret to me what I was saying. And immediately, just like this says, He brought back to my remembrance what He had spoken to me through this prophecy. It was the key, and it has become one of the greatest things that has happened in my life and ministry, and it was through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit functional in your life and intentionally trying to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, you are not going to be a successful Christian. And this is exactly the reason that so many Christians fail is because they do it their way. They lean unto their own understanding. They go ahead and do their own thing and only after they crash and burn do they turn to God. The Holy Spirit will show you things to come. It says this over in John chapter 16 and in verse 13, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. Just think about this. How beneficial would it be if you could know what was happening, what was coming? If you could see it, if you could be warned in advance, man, I, I don't think most of us really understand that the Holy Spirit is sent to show us things to come. 
He will warn you about things. He'll tell you that stuff is going to come. There are so many times. I remember being in a church one time and a guy, he just was as nice to me as he could possibly be in the natural. There was no reason to think anything bad. And yet the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, don't trust that guy any further than you can throw him. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing. And you know what? I didn't have any reason to believe that in the natural, but I followed that because I'd learned to listen to the Holy Spirit and God saved my bacon through that. How many times, if we could listen to the Holy Spirit, would, it, would He tell you that, you know, this person, uh, they may look good, but it's ulterior motives. It's not all that it appears. If, the whole, if we could listen to the Holy Spirit, how many times would that help us? You know, let me just make an application right here. There are some of you, and I'm not saying any of these things to hurt you or to bother you, but there are some of you that are in a marriage that isn't good. It's a... Uh, it's a bad marriage, and it's a major problem in your life. And you know why you're there? Because you didn't let the Holy Spirit lead you. God brought Eve to Adam, Ruth to Boaz, Rebecca to Isaac. God will put marriages together. It says that, uh, you know, if you find a wife, you find a good thing and obtain favor of the Lord. And then in Psalms 34, no good thing will the Lord withhold from them who seek Him. Instead of seeking a mate, the scripture says we're supposed to seek God and God will bring us our mate, just like He did Adam and Isaac and Boaz. And yet there are some of you, and again, I'm not saying this to condemn you, but you did it your way. You picked the person that you just lusted after. You thought this was great and you knew that the word says don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers and yet you didn't listen to the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you, how's that working out for you? And I can guarantee you there's people all around the world right now that you're in a bad situation because you did it your way. The Holy Spirit will show you your mate. The Holy Spirit will show you your job you're supposed to have. The Lord will show you how to do your job. The Holy Spirit is there to help us. It's called, he's called the helper. And He will help us. But you have to take advantage of this ministry of the Holy Spirit. You know, even among spirit-filled people, that's a name that's put on a lot of people who have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I go into these spirit-filled churches and I give invitations and it's not unusual to see hundreds of people from these spirit-filled churches that come forward to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. And what I'm saying through this is there's people who claim that and they... They call themselves Spirit-filled. Maybe they did receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit 20, 30 years ago, but it's not a one-time deal. It's, you're supposed to be filled. It's a constant filling. It's not just a one-time experience. You have to walk and let the Holy Spirit minister through you on a constant basis. And I'm just shocked to go into these quote-unquote Spirit-filled churches that they don't even preach on the Holy Spirit. They don't teach people that, man, we need to be led by the Holy Spirit, we, about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I'm sure that there are people watching this program right now who believe that all of these gifts of the Holy Spirit passed away. I was raised in a Baptist church and they told us that those things didn't happen today. That was for the people in the Bible, but it doesn't happen today. There are some of you that have been taught those things, but I'm telling you, that's not true. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are real. I have operated in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and called people out by name that I've never seen before. Somebody says, you can't do that. Jesus did it. He looked up in a tree and said, Zacchaeus, come down. He had never met this man. And yet he was operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's called a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. These things are for us today. The Holy Spirit will show you things to come. It also says here in John chapter 15, and in verse 26, But when the Comforter is come, again, speaking of the Holy Spirit, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. And so the Holy Spirit is sent to testify of Jesus, to keep our focus upon Jesus. The Holy Spirit does not glorify himself. He glorifies Jesus. But the scriptures reveal that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential. 
Let me go on down here in John chapter 16. Again, I'm messing up the sequence of this a little bit, but there's just a number of different times that Jesus, during this last instruction to his disciples, talked about how important the ministry of the Holy Spirit is. And so I want to put all of these things together and try and impact you with how important it is to have the Holy Spirit operating in your life. In John chapter 16, in verse 5, Jesus said, But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me whither goest thou. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you. The word expedient means it's to your advantage. You're better off. This is for your own good. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now think about what Jesus is saying. Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm leaving, but it's actually to your benefit. It's actually better. It's expedient to your advantage to have the Holy Spirit in you than it is to have me with you. That is a huge statement. You know, probably the majority of people watching this program, if you had an option to say, what would you rather have, the ministry of the Holy Spirit that is available to all of us today, or would you rather have Jesus in His physical body walk in and talk to you and speak to you and do something? I guarantee you most people would choose the physical presence of Jesus, and yet Jesus says that the ministry of the Holy Spirit indwelling you is more beneficial to you than having me in my physical body with you. Wow. That's not what most people think. I guarantee you there are very few Christians that given the option would choose the present ministry of the Holy Spirit over the bodily presence of Jesus. And yet Jesus himself said, this is to your own advantage. It's better to have the Holy Spirit. Wow, that's amazing. And many people that have even received the Holy Spirit says, man, I don't even see that. That's because we aren't taking full advantage of it. You know, the Holy Spirit doesn't force Himself upon you. You have to pursue. You have to yield to the Holy Spirit. You have to be seeking this ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. It doesn't just work automatically. And the way that the baptism of the Holy Spirit has been presented, there are many people that will come to kind of a climax and they will have a squirt of faith and they will experience this uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues but they think that that's all it's for. It's just to prove that you've got it. They don't understand the daily ministry of the Holy Spirit in their life. They haven't been trained to depend upon the Holy Spirit, to expect the gifts of the Holy Spirit to operate in their life. And because of it, the Holy Spirit doesn't just do it unless you yield to Him and draw these things out. You have to seek to find. You have to knock to have the door open unto you. You have to ask to receive. And most Christians just seek, the, even if they have the Holy Spirit, they only sought the Holy Spirit just for the experience sake, and they don't understand the practical, everyday ministry of the Holy Spirit. Jesus went on to expound on this a little bit. In verse 8, this is John 16, 8, He says, When He has come, speaking of the Holy Spirit, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Notice, He doesn't just reprove the world of sin, period. He does three things, but it's really one ministry of the Holy Spirit. He reproves the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And the Lord knew that people would misinterpret this. And so he explains it in the next three verses. In verse 9, of sin, because they believe not on me. The sin, singular, not sins, plural, but the sin, singular, that the Holy Spirit convicts people about is the sin of not believing on Jesus. Now, I am not saying that the Holy Spirit won't tell you when you're doing something wrong and say this is sin. But the sin, I don't know how to say this shortly. I've got this entire series on this, the positive ministry of the Holy Spirit that will explain it in greater detail. But trying to say it succinctly here, the the root of all sin is just not believing on Jesus, not trusting Jesus. If a person is out doing dope, you know, certainly doing dope is bad. It's going to cost you money. It's going to ruin your health. You could have 
uh, all kinds of problems through shared needles. You could have a wreck you, by driving buzzed or, or high on dope and you could lose your job and on and on and on. And I mean, there's many consequences and all of those things are wrong. But you know, if you just peel back the layers, you know what's really wrong with a uh, Christian doing dope? Is that you are trying to cope with your situations in some way other than trusting in Jesus. So the Holy Spirit will just say, why don't you trust Jesus? He, he won't just, it's not the sin, the action that's so bad. It's the fact that you are substituting this substance for what Jesus is meant. Jesus is meant to give you a high. I'm not talking about where you're out of control, but an emotional high where you are having joy and peace and you shouldn't have to look to a pill or to a needle to get those kind of things. You aren't trusting Jesus. You know, the real thing that's wrong with adultery and sexual sins, again, there's multi, mo, uh, many layers of wrong involved with that. But many times Christians will say, well, you shouldn't do this because you could get a sexually transmitted disease. You could get AIDS. You could have this. And they talk about these consequences. All of that's true. And that's reason enough not to go commit sexual sins. But let's just say, what happens if they came up with a cure for AIDS? What happened if they had a cure for all sexually transmitted diseases? Does that mean it's okay now? See, when you use that reasoning and you talk about these consequences and say, this is the reason God told you not to do it, you're missing the point. The real bottom line is that you aren't trusting Jesus. He gave you your mate. And he told you to be satisfied with your mate at all times. He told you that it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And when you go into a homosexual relationship, you can talk about all of the negative uh, side effects of that. But the bottom line is you aren't trusting Jesus. You aren't following what he told you. You are exalting your wisdom. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit is not to just nail you over this sin and over this sin and over this one. It's the one sin that why aren't you trusting Jesus? Why aren't you taking what He has spoken to you? That's what it's all about. And you know, when a person is not born again, it's not that the Holy Spirit is saying, well, you've committed adultery, you've lied, you've stealed, you've stolen, you've done this, all of these things. That all may be true, but the bottom line is you haven't trusted Jesus. And that's what the Holy Spirit will bring you to. He's not going to nail you. It's not a negative ministry of criticism. It's the positive ministry of why don't you commit your life to Jesus? He loves you, and it's all a positive ministry. You know, if a parent was to correct their child, and the only thing you ever did was point out what they were wrong, and you just criticized them and railed on them, I guarantee you this is why the children go the other direction. This is why some mates leave, is because the person has just got the ministry of criticism. And sad to say, many people have been taught that this is the way that the Holy Spirit is. He'll just make you miserable. No, the Holy Spirit has a positive ministry to tell you that He loves you. Why are you looking to this alcohol, to this dope, to this sexual encounter, to fill the void that's on the inside? God wants to fill that place in your life. That's the positive ministry of the Holy Spirit. And remember, He always convicts of sin, the sin of not believing on Jesus, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Most people interpret this, and when it says of righteousness, it goes on to say in verse 10, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Most people just immediately transpose this somehow or another to he convicts of unrighteousness, that the Holy Spirit will tell you that you've sinned and because of that you're unrighteous. It didn't say he's convicting of unrighteousness. He's convicting of righteousness. In other words, after he shows you that, look, what's really wrong with you doing this dope and stuff is the fact that you aren't trusting Jesus. You're taking a pill, a, a shot of something to supply what Jesus could do. He'll point out what the deficit is and what's wrong, but then he'll say, but you are the righteousness of God. Now, this is the ministry to a believer. You are the righteousness of God. Even though you're failing in this area, even though all of this, God still loves you. See, this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit replaced the ministry of Jesus. When Jesus was here on this earth, he took the woman taken in the very act of adultery and he didn't say that she hadn't sinned. He didn't say, oh, I'm changing all the rules and now adultery is okay. Don't feel bad about it. No, he told her, he says, woman, go and sin no more. He called it sin, but he didn't condemn her. Instead, he ministered righteousness, right standing. 
No man's condemned you, neither do I condemn you. You are now in right standing with God. So he pointed out that it was sin, but yes, you're righteous. You are accepted. And see, this is what the Holy Spirit will do. He may show you something you're doing that is giving Satan an inroad into your life, but instead of condemning you, he'll say you are the righteousness of God. And then in verse 11, it says that the Holy Spirit will convict of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Not your judgment, but the judgment of Satan, the accuser of the brethren, the one who's been condemning you and making you feel like scum because you failed and sinned. The Holy Spirit will convict you of his judgment. And he will remind you that, hey, regardless of what you've done, look at Satan. You think your future's bad. Look at Satan's future. And he will remind you of all of these things and build you up. So the positive ministry of the Holy Spirit is not to condemn and beat you down. It's to show you that Jesus loves you. It's to convict you that you aren't trusting Jesus. Go back to trusting Jesus. You're still the righteousness of God. Satan has been judged. You ha are not going to be judged. Your judgment was placed upon Jesus. And it's a positive ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's what all of this is about. And again, there is just so much here in John 14, 15, and 16. I'm going through this very quickly. This is a lot more information on it. But you need this. And again, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I shared some of these things yesterday, but it is not synonymous with being saved. When you get born again, the Holy Spirit is involved. You can't be born again without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And you can't receive the Holy Spirit until you have, first of all, been born again. The Bible says Jesus is the one who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. So you've got to receive the giver before you receive the gift. So you need to be born again, but when you get born again, it's not automatic that you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The disciples in John chapter 20, they were born again. They confessed Jesus was risen from the dead, which is what the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that you have to do to be born again. So they were born again, and yet he told them, don't go anywhere, don't tell anybody what you've seen until you receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit and uh, fire. And when they received it in Acts chapter 2, they spoke with tongues. The baptism of the Holy Spirit includes speaking in tongues. And I want to encourage you that if you've not received this, please call that number that you see on your screen. We've got people that would love to pray with you 